social origins of psychosis. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we're talking about people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or any of those kind of related conditions. Schizophrenia is not a term which I'm particularly comfortable with for various reasons. It kind of lumps together a lot of people who have lots of different kind of symptoms and difficulties. And there's a real issue about whether schizophrenia is a meaningful concept in for doing research in medical illness. I'm not going to say very much about that here, although it will come out as we, as we go along, I think. But perhaps I should just say, just to start off, just to kind of explain the approach I'm taking. If you think that schizophrenia isn't a particularly useful concept, then you have to find another way of looking at the phenomenon which are associated with the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So nobody would doubt, for example, that people hear voices sometimes, or people are paranoid sometimes, or people have some of the other symptoms of, which, of schizophrenia. And the approach which some of us take, and Dan here has done a lot of work in this area as well, Dan and I know each other very well, uh, is basically to look at the particular types of, to just select individual symptoms and try and explain those. So instead of, whereas we might have some trouble knowing who has schizophrenia, we don't have that much trouble knowing who hears voices or who is paranoid, for example. And I would argue that if you look at psychosis, schizophrenia in this kind of way, actually what happens is that the causes become a lot easier to understand. So, um, and I'll illustrate that as we go along, really. Um, but I just want to start, before I get to that point, I really want to talk about, just to review what we know about social risk factors for uh, psychosis. Um, about 15 years ago, if you looked in most psychiatry textbooks, you'd find that there was no social causes of psychosis. And it was widely cited, widely believed that, uh, for example, schizophrenia, whatever that is, is almost is very widely inherited, uh, so almost completely inherited. If you, um, a, f a figure which is bandied about quite a lot is the notion of 80% heritability. People talk about schizophrenia being 80% heritable. Uh, and these figures were generated from things like twin studies, studies of that sort. And the problem with that number is it seems to imply that 80% of the cause is genetic. If you say that schizophrenia is 80% heritable, it seems to imply that, that uh, that causes largely genetic. And so, because people made that assumption, generally they didn't look for social causes of psychosis. In actual fact, the idea that schizophrenia is 80% heritable doesn't mean that it's 80% caused by genetics. Heritability, a heritability coefficient is simply a partial correlation coefficient. It's nothing else than that, really. And uh, you will remember from the first time you studied psychology, those of you who studied psychology, what was the first thing you were taught about correlations? Correlation doesn't necessarily imply causality. So uh, it's the statement that schizophrenia is 80% uh, heritable just means that at some level, somebody's calculated that there's some kind of 80% correlation between uh, genes and psychosis, but there might be all sorts of different reasons for that. Now, I could say a lot more about heritability. There is actually a one-hour talk to be given, which I could do, which would probably bore you all my, about what's wrong with the heritability coefficient, but let's just put it to the side for my, I simply want to make the point that just because if you look up in psychiatric textbooks, it tells you that schizophrenia is 80% heritable, it doesn't mean that the major cause is genetic. It doesn't mean that at all. It's a simple misunderstanding about heritability coefficients. So what kind of social causes are there? Or what do we think might be social risk factors for psychosis? And it turns out to be rather a lot of them. So here are the main ones. Urban environments. Living in an urban environment seems to increase the risk of psychosis. Being poor, especially when you're young, appears to be uh, a risk factor. Uh, living in an unequal society. I'll elaborate a little bit about some of these things as we go along. Seems to increase the risk. Migration has a massive effect on risk. If you're a migrant, you have a much greater chance of being psychotic than if you're uh, uh, somebody belonging to an, a majority uh, indigenous group. Something called parental communication deviance, it's to do with the way your parents talk to you. I'll go on and uh, talk about that in a little bit. Uh, being separated from your parents at an early age, uh, being abused or maltreated uh, either by your family or by peers when you're a child, that has a massive effect uh, on. Uh, risk of psychosis and uh, being bullied at school. Now, I can't review all the evidence in all these areas, but I'm just going to mention some of them, just so you get an idea. This is 
a very famous map drawn by two sociologists, Farris and Dunham, uh, of Chicago in the 1930s. What they did was, taking the definition of schizophrenia as it was at the time, it was a bit looser even than the definition today, to be fair, what they did was they looked at the density of uh, schizophrenia in different neighbourhoods, the number of people with schizophrenia in different neighbourhoods. And what they found was if you went to the inner city areas, where the poor areas with high density, then there was a lot of schizophrenia patients per head of population. If you went out to the affluent suburbs, there were a lot less. Now, um, Ferris and Dunham actually thought that this was because living in a poor neighbourhood actually might cause schizophrenia, but that was almost immediately dismissed by more conventional thinking in psychiatry uh, and explained away in terms of a uh, concept of social drift. The idea of social drift is that if you are schizophrenic you are psychotic, you can't function very well, you can't hold down a job, therefore you're poor, therefore you have to go and live in a, in a city neighbourhood. Now, social drift undoubtedly happens, but we know for certain that it's not the explanation for this effect, so it's certainly not the whole explanation. Uh, so, from a lot of recent studies which have looked at this effect, uh, what's particularly remarkable is that uh, this is a study by Pedersen Mortensen, uh, looking at two million Danish adults. They were able to trace where they lived when they were kids, because they have very good records of that sort of thing in uh, Denmark, and they were able to look at who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and who didn't. And what they found was that there was simple what we call a dose-response relationship between living in an inner city area before the age of 15 and risk of psychosis. In other words, the more time in childhood you spent in the city, the greater the risk. And they came up with a number, actually. It's called the population attributable risk or population attributable fraction. This is, they calculated with the fancy maths what would happen if you took away this risk factor. What kind of reduction would you get in terms of the number of people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia? It was 15%. The population attributable risk was 15%. So if everybody grew up in a nice little rural neighbourhood, then there would be 15% less schizophrenia patients. So um, I'll, I'm going to skip through a few things as we go on because we've not got that much time. What about poverty and social disadvantage? Well, again, it turns out that poverty in childhood turns out to be quite a potent risk factor for psychosis. If you grow up poor, then you're more likely to be psychotic. And this has been shown in a lot of very careful studies, again in the Scandinavian countries where there's very good records, so it's possible for researchers to find out the circumstances in which big children grew up. Uh, there was a very neat study by Wicks which actually used uh, a genetic methodology to control for genes. It was actually what we call an adoption study. They looked at adopted away children. Of course, adopted away children are very interesting from a genetic perspective because they're brought up by people who they're not biologically related to. Now, what they found was that uh, poverty in childhood was a risk factor of psychosis even when you join, uh, control for <coughs> genetic risk. So it's not just, for example, if you've got bad genes, your, if your parents have got bad genes, then they tend to be poor, so you inherit their bad genes. Um, really interesting uh, top issue which has cropped up in recent years is the idea that it's not just poverty which is important, it's inequality. So poverty and inequality are not the same thing. This is a picture from Sao Paulo uh, in South America, and you can see uh, a vivid example of inequality here where you've got the sort of fantastic apartments here, and then you've got on this uh, side a, 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 a sort of slum dwelling. So uh, societies differ quite dramatically in terms of level of inequality, and inequality doesn't correlate with wealth. Some people think that you have to have a lot of inequality to have wealth, to which there is a one-word answer, and that is Norway. Norway is one of, the, one of the most equal countries in the world. It's also one of the, it's, depending on which way you calculate it, in the top three richest countries in the world. On the other hand, I think quite a few of you are here from the United States, and the bad news is that you live in a very unequal country, but it doesn't make you any more wealthier than the Norwegians. Uh, but I'm going to say that without any sense of smugness because the second most unequal country in the developed world is this one, Britain. So, uh, so there's no straight relationship between inequality and, um, um, and wealth. If you want to look at some numbers on this, by the way, you might. Uh, the place where you can find them is the CIA published them. There's something called the CIA World Factbook, Factbook, which is available online, and they publish inequality data and other economic data for all the countries of the world. It turns out that 
inequality separately from poverty predicts all sorts of unpleasant things, but one of the things it predicts is the rates of common mental illness, those are things like depression and anxiety and so on. And recent studies have shown that it, it uh, affects also the risk of psychosis, again, both in international comparisons and also when you look at particular neighbourhoods. So there's a chap called James Kirk Bride at Cambridge who's done some fantastic work on this. Um, he's worked out how to look at uh, inequality at a very neighbourhood level. So basically, if you live in a poor neighbourhood, it's, it's the difference between living in a poor neighbourhood surrounded by other poor neighbourhoods and living in a poor neighbourhood surrounded by rich neighbourhoods. And the latter is much worse, basically. I mean, it is an amazing thing, but it seems to be growing up poor doesn't do you anything like as much damage as growing up poor surrounded by rich people. Why would that be? Well, we don't really know, but obviously it's something to do with social comparison. It seems to be important. Um, migration, I mentioned migration. Um, research on uh, uh, migration and psychosis basically or originates in Britain, really, in the 1980s and 1990s with an interest in Afro-Caribbeans. Uh, in the 1950s, a lot of Afro-Caribbeans moved to Britain. They were encouraged to come here to take up jobs because we didn't have enough jobs to, for, for, for indigenous people at the time. Um, and uh, in the 1990s, it was noticed that Afro-Caribbeans had something like an in the increased risk is remarkable. It's something like a five times increased risk of psychosis compared to a white person living in Britain. Now, at the time, people thought that might be because psychiatrists were rather biased in their judgments in terms of diagnosing who was schizophrenic and who wasn't. But it turns out that that's not the case because there are all sorts of different ways of looking at this. But one thing is, it turns out it's true of migrants in other countries and not just in Britain. It's not just about Britain. Uh, but here's a really interesting thing. The risk of psychosis for, some, for, a, for somebody belonging, bit belonging to an ethnic minority group depends, again, on what neighbourhood they're in. So a black person living in a pre predominantly black neighbourhood in Britain does not have an increased risk of psychosis. There's no detectable increased risk. On the other hand, a black person living in a predominantly white neighbourhood does have an increased risk of psychosis. And in fact, we know what the ethnic density has to be for people to be protected. It's, it's about 25%. If 25% of the neighbourhood belongs to an ethnic minority, it, it's, it, you know, if the population is, belongs to an ethnic minority, then there isn't a risk. Below that level, there is a risk. And again, it suggests that social comparison might be uh, important. And if that's the case, one of the things you might expect is that the more different people look, the greater the risk of psychosis, and that turns out to be the case. Studies in Holland show, you can, in Holland, which is a predominantly white country, uh, like this one, you can actually predict the risk of psychosis based on skin color. The more different people are from a white skin color, the, the more different their group is from a white skin color, the higher the risk. So that seems to be a pretty powerful effect. Um, one um, risk factor which has been very interested to a lot of clinical psychologists like myself has been childhood trauma and that includes sexual abuse and physical abuse and things like having your parent die at an early age so you're separating them through their death because they die, that sort of thing. Now, uh, this is a really controversial area up to a few years ago. Ten years ago, well I know because I've been in that position, where you stand up in front of a psychiatric audience and say childhood sexual abuse is a risk factor for psychosis, people would almost laugh at you. They don't laugh now because the evidence is so strong. Um, recently, myself and some other people uh, in Holland, a uh, group in Holland led by a chap called Jim Van Os, we carried out a meta-analysis. Now, I don't know if you, well, you know what meta-analysis is. It's basically a technique where you comb through the literature and you find the best studies which are available you have some criteria in advance about what counts as a good study, so you only select those studies where you're sure of the data, and then you synthesize them. You do that by adding together, there's a mathematical techniques which allow you to add together results from the different studies to get an overall picture, to get an overall answer, because of course studies, for all sorts of idiosyncratic reasons, don't always give you the same results. Now there are a lot of studies in this area, but when you whittle through uh, the number, you know, all those which have been published to get down to those which are any good. You end up with eight epidemiological cross-sectional studies. These are studies where researchers go out into the community, pick a random selection of the population, and ask them about their life experiences, and uh, also interview them about psychiatric symptoms. There are ten 
prospective studies or quasi-prospective studies. These are the ones where children followed up at birth and at some point it's found that either they're sexually abused or not, say, and then you see what happens to them in adulthood. They're obviously quite arduous studies to carry out, but people have carried them out. And finally, there are patient control studies. These are the ones where you ask the patients the story of their lives and you ask controls the story of their lives. Now, I should just point out that there's there are more patient control studies than other studies. That's because they're easier to do. And people mistrust patient control studies. People have always said, well, you never know with psychiatric patients. If they tell you that something horrible has happened to them in childhood, how do we know that they're telling the truth? I'm going to give you a good reason for thinking they're telling the truth in a minute. So what do we find? Now, this diagram here is what you get out of a meta-analysis. It looks complicated, but hopefully I can explain it to you. It's called a forest plot. And what we've got here is each of the individual studies, so these are the case control studies, the patient control studies, these are the ones where patients tell us about their lives. These are the epidemiological studies, the cross-sectional studies, and these are the prospective studies. And you'll see that each study has a line. Now, this line tells us what the results of that study is. Okay? So this is the line of no effect. That's an odds ratio of one. So if you're sitting on that line, that means there's no greater risk of psychosis. Okay? Anything to this side of the line means that the risk factor is, a, is th that whatever it is, is is increasing the risk of psychosis. Anything to this side means that whatever it is is protective. So each of these uh, studies has what we call what well, has a uh, the the actual effect size, which is the blip in the middle, plus a confidence interval. That means that we're confident that the result, you know, using statistics, we're confident that the, that the true result lies somewhere along that line. So if the confidence interval doesn't ex intersect the line of zero effect, it means there is an effect, okay, statistically. So the first thing to notice is almost everything is that side of a line. Nearly everything is that side of a line. The exception is this one study here, which appeared to show that if you grew up in Japan and your parents died, you were less likely to be psychotic. Now, why that would be, I have no idea. Nobody has any idea. Whether it's something about Japan, I don't know. But anyway... It's clearly an outlier. It clearly doesn't fit in with the rest of the studies. And in fact, if we analyse the data with or without that study, because it's a very stored study, it doesn't make any difference. We did both. So everything else is that side of the line, and nearly all of them are statistically significant. And also, you can see it doesn't make much difference what type of study we've got. So in summary, what we find is that for the patient control studies, the odds ratio is about three. That means that somebody who has had a trauma in childhood is three times like, more likely than anyone else to be psychotic in adulthood. The epidemiological study, uh, cross-sectional studies, the odds ratio is about three. And in the prospective studies, the odds ratio is about three. So all three types of studies are giving us the same answer, in fact, spookily the same answer. And one of the things that means is that you can trust what patients tell you. Because if you base your results on what patients tell you, you get the same answer as if you use these other methods. So mostly, of course, occasionally you come across a psychotic patient who will tell you, uh, you know, about interesting things which happened to them when they were queen of the sheep or something like that. But that's actually rare. Mostly when patients tell us about their early life experiences, they're telling us pretty much the truth. So, how big is this effect? Well, one way of figuring out how big it is is comparing it to something which you're familiar with. Now, in the 1950s, when it was first discovered that smoking was linked to lung cancer, it seems incredible now, but nobody wanted to believe it. And doctors had to be, there was huge arguments at the time between different doctors about whether smoking was harmful to health, which is curiously similar to the kind of arguments which people are having now about whether childhood trauma is important to severe mental illness. But we all accept now that smoking is dangerous, and so we can compare this kind of risk with the risk associated with smoking. Before we do, sorry, and one thing I meant to say is this. This is just for children who have experienced one type of trauma in childhood. In some of the studies, it's possible to look at what happens when people have more than one type of trauma. So, for example, when they get sexually abused and they get bullied at school and a parent dies, that sort of thing. And when you add them up, you get enormous risk factors. So this there was a study called the National Comorbidity Survey carried out in the United States. It was an epidemiological study. And it turned out that those children had experienced five types of trauma. They had lots of different types of trauma on their list. That the, the, the odds ratio was over 50. 
Now, an odds ratio of over 50 is enormous. It is far bigger than any genetic effect that anybody's ever discovered. So, how does that compare with smoking? Well, uh, about 10 or so years ago, somebody published a meta-analysis of the literature on smoking. They looked at the risk of getting lung cancer given smoking cigarettes between 1 and 40 years. And the odds ratios went from 3.38 to 33.60. It's about the same, roughly speaking. You can say that the risk of psychosis given trauma in childhood is about the same as the risk of uh, lung cancer given smoking. Of course, some people will smoke all their lives and not get lung cancer. Of course, there are kids who get horrible things happen to them in childhood and they're resilient and they survive. But there's no doubt from this that childhood trauma is, increases the likelihood that somebody will become psychotic. Oh, don't know what's going on here. So I wasn't meant to do that. I should say, by the way, sorry, that uh, the population attributable risk um, turns out to be uh, for childhood trauma, it's about 30, 30, 33%. It's almost exactly a third. So uh, if we could make the world a happier place for children, the world over, there would be, roughly speaking, a third less people with psychosis, it looks like. One of the things I mentioned before was this thing called communication deviance. Communication deviance is a complicated thing to get over, so I'll just try and explain it in two or three words. It turns out there's a lot of studies actually mainly from the United States, British researchers haven't been all that interested in this. It turns out that sometimes if parents speak to children in a way which is it's called communication deviance, it's actually a way which is vague and fragmentary. It's not particularly it's just a bit odd, actually, if you if you if you listen to some of it. But it's a, co a conversational style which is very difficult to follow, basically. It's very difficult to figure out where the person's going. The person changes track all the time. And a lot of American studies have measured communication devi deviance in parents and looked at the risk of psychosis in their children. And again, it turns out to be quite a potent risk factor. We'd recently did a meta-analysis of that, uh, and the interesting thing was that we found that uh, it was communication deviance in mums which was important. Communication deviance in father didn't seem to have any effect whatsoever. Now, uh, there might be various different reasons for this, but the most likely one is that kids don't see that much of their fathers in traditional families, uh, so fathers just don't have all that much influence. Um, we know, incidentally, that this effect is, I mean, one obvious interpretation is that if the parent has a schizophrenia gene, it makes them speak oddly, and they pass the gene on to their kids. But we know that's not the case because there is one Finnish study, which is a genetically controlled study, basically it was an adoption study. What happens? They had 200 kids whose biological parents, were, whose mothers were schizophrenic. They were then adopted by, uh, they were adopted by families where parents didn't have any mental illness. And they also had 200 controlled children who were parents, biological parents were not, didn't have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and who were also adopted. And what they found was that the risk of, the risk of mental illness in the children uh, was greater in the children who had biological parents who had psychosis, so that shows a genetic effect, but only if the adopting parents showed communication deviance. So it's a gene times environment interaction, you call that. So there's a genetic risk, but it only becomes illness if they're exposed to an environmental risk factor. Uh, I'll skip that. So, uh, so remember at the beginning I said I was kind of interested in looking at the symptoms of psychosis because it's free is too broad a concept to be useful, I think. Uh, you might think that I'm wrong about that given that we've got actually some useful evidence just using diagnoses such as schizophrenia and studies I've already talked about. But it kind of gets really interesting if you look for specific symptom effects. Is there a link between these types of life experiences and uh, particular symptoms? And we think we found some. Again, I'll, I'll skip a bit. Um, um, so we recently carried out a study looking at uh, data from something called the Adult Psychiatric Morbidities Survey, which was a survey of 7,000 British citizens, adult citizens, who were interviewed about their life experiences, and they were also given lots of interviews about, lots of questions about psychiatric symptoms. And we were particularly interested in two types of symptoms. One is auditory verbal hallucinations. So this is hearing voices when nobody's there. And that's 
a common symptom of schizophrenia. And the other was paranoid beliefs. This is believing that you're being persecuted, having a kind of a rational belief uh, that you're being persecuted. And in this survey, those two things were measured, and also lots of different types of childhood adversity. So uh, they included some pretty nasty things happening to people, such as being raped before the age of 16. Uh, they also looked at physical abuse, bullying. Now, this one's interesting. Institutional care. Institutional care has been brought up in a children's home. Um, and uh, local authority care, this has been brought up by foster parents. Now, we did some fancy maths because lots of people have hallucinations, also have paranoid delusions. So you have to sort of use some maths to poke under the bonnet a bit and see exactly what's happening. Anyway, what we found was something interesting. We found that um, being raped in childhood, we, we predicted this on the basis of some not so well controlled studies which have been carried out before, being raped in childhood, so that's non-consensual penetrative sex before the age of 16, increased the risk of auditory verbal hallucinations by an odds ratio of about nine. So a child who'd been sexually abused had a nine times increased risk of hearing voices, but there's no effect on paranoid delusions. You won't be able to see those numbers, you just have to take my word for it. But, anyway. uh, but you know, they're available in the paper if you, if you don't trust me. Being brought up in institutional care increased the risk of paranoia. The risk loss ratio was 11, but there wasn't a significant effect on hallucinations. Now, why would that be? Well, what is it about? Well, I'll come to hallucinations in a bit. But why would it? What's it about institutional care? Well, if you're brought up in a children's home, basically, you're, it's almost guaranteed that the bond between yourself and your birth parents has been shattered totally. That's what the circumstances which leads people to be brought up in, in children's homes. We know that bond is very important for adult emotional development. And one thing which is particularly important for is developing the ability to trust other people. So it makes sense that somebody brought up in institutional care would have an increased risk of paranoid symptoms. Now you might say, just say, well, yes, okay, that looks very nice, but this is just one study. You could have done, been doing a bit of data fishing. It might have just turned out like that. But we've got some other studies. So that study is British. We managed to get hold of an American data set. We analyzed it in a slightly different way. Well, well using the same principles, so it's just the data is presented slightly different here. But, but in this one, this is the US National Comorbidity Survey. Again, being rated childhood specifically increased the risk of hallucinations in adulthood, but not the risk of paranoid symptoms. They didn't measure institutional care in the United States. What they did was they measured neglect being neglected by your parents. That specifically increases the risk of paranoia, but not the risk of hallucinations. Now, just to add a little qualifier here, they also looked at common psychiatric problems, not just these extreme ones. So depression, depression was more or less caused by, you know, that's caused by a lot of things. So sexual abuse did increase the risk of depression as well as the risk of hallucinations. The point is within the psychotic domain, the specific effect was hallucinations. Recently looked at a study, it's not published yet, we're sort of revising it, but it's basically about 3,000 British prisoners in a, uh, something called the Survey of Psychiatric Morbidity amongst prisoners in England and Wales. Uh, so lots of prisoners were asked the same questions, similar questions to the ones we looked at before. And um, uh, it was actually a quite substantial representative sample of prisoners. Um, and would you believe it? Exactly the same result. So sexual abuse, so they were asked to talk about childhood, sexual abuse was linked to hallucinations. So, uh, patients, so prisoners who had hallucinations were likely to have been sexually abused. Also prisoners who had both paranoia and hallucinations. Um, in terms of being raised, up, raised in an institution, there was a specific effect again on paranoia, not on hallucinations. So we've got two replications there, and this is starting to look like a, you know, a kind of a sort of solid, solid finding. Now I'm going to I've got to move on, but because I've been given the two minute warning two minutes ago, but I'm going to take another two minutes. So that's okay, right? We found uh, a few. We found lots of other things. So one of the things we found is, for example, okay, so neighbourhood. What about the neighbourhood you live in? What kind of symptom would you expect to be linked to living in a deprived neighbourhood? 
It's a bit of a no-brainer. It's paranoia. And again, that turns out to be the case. That actually fits with some really nice studies which Dan did a few years ago, getting people to walk in to private neighbourhoods, and what happens, not surprisingly, they feel more paranoid. <laughs> so, um, so, <laughs> so, you know. Um, Can't do that since I've been <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's had to give up his research since he's moved here. Okay, so how, what do we make all this? Okay, so I'm going to finish probably just, I'll just talk about this chat for a minute because he's very important. Um, and then I had a few other slides, but we'll have to go around. But anyway, this chap is a hero of modern medicine. He's called Austin Bradford Hill. You've probably not heard of him. Most people outside of medicine haven't heard of him. But he was a genius in his own way. He wasn't a doctor, he was a statistician. Okay? Now, Austin Bradford Hill is famous for two things. One is, he was involved in the discovery about the link between smoking and lung cancer. In Britain, there's lots of American researchers involved as well, but in Britain we tend to say, that, attribute that discovery to a chap called Richard Dodd. The important thing to know is that Richard Dodd was Austin Bradford Hill's research assistant. The uh, other thing which he's famous for is that this guy devised the first modern randomised control trial ever. So, randomised control trials are how we test whether the treatments work. He was the guy who came up with the idea of doing those kind of experiments. Okay. Now, because nobody wants to believe that there was a link between uh, smoking and lung cancer, and he convinced himself that there was a link, uh, he didn't expect to find it, actually, initially. He, was, he himself was quite sceptical for a short while. Uh, but because of that, he's, he's decided, to, he's trying to think of how do you know whether things are causal from epidemiological data. He came up with nine criteria. So, and these are Hill's criteria, as they're called now. So, strength of association. Is there a strong association? Yes, there is, in this case. So, the idea is if you meet all these criteria, you can say that, that something's causal. Is the data consistent? It's very, very consistent. It's much more consistent than a lot of other areas of science. Are there specific effects? Yes, there are. Child and sexual abuse seems to increase the risk of hallucinations, not paranoia. Is there a temporal relationship? In other words, does the cause precede the effect? Obviously, if we're talking about childhood maltreatment and, and a mental illness in adulthood, it is. Is there what he called a biological gradient or what we now call a dose-response relationship? In other words, if the worst trauma is the great, is there, does that mean there's a greater likelihood of psychosis? Yes, there is. Plausibility in terms of mechanism, I'll come back to that in a moment. Coherence, does it connect with other types of data? Yes, you can traumatise animals. Basically, it's, you can do it in the lab. Uh, it's not a pleasant thing to do, I wouldn't like to do it myself, but one way you do it is by dropping a sort of small rodent in the cage of a big angry rodent. It's not very nice of a small rodent, you do that over and over again. The brain changes which you find are very similar to the brain changes which you find in patients with psychosis. Reversibility, if you take away the risk factor, if you get people to start smoking, do, do the lung cancer rates go down? They do. But what about in this case? So this was the one criterion which I thought we didn't have now, but we, you know, nobody found anything about it. But there is now a study, it was published last year in Ireland, she looked at children who were bullied at school, and some of them showed what we call subsyndromal psychotic symptoms. So he started to show just the earlier stages of psychosis, and when the bullying was stopped, those symptoms went away. So it is reversible. Consideration of alternative explanations, yes, some of the studies have control for genetic factors. So yes, the only one which people, I think people get hung up on is this one, which is mechanisms. And I was going to tell you about some of the mechanisms, but I haven't got time, but just to say that we think we know quite a bit about the mechanisms which might be responsible for this. I'm quite happy to answer questions about it afterwards. But we're beginning to explore the mechanisms both at the psychological level, looking at the kind of stuff which Dan and I are very familiar, you know, it's our bread and butter, which is kind of cognitive tests of one sort or another, but also uh, in terms of brain sciences, because, of course, wherever there's mental processes going on, there are biological processes going on as well. So it's, for example, it's not proven, but there's a lot of evidence which is pointing in the direction that... Um, the kind of traumas which lead to paranoia lead to changes in the dopamine system in the brain. And there's lots of uh, evidence linking dopamine to psychosis. So I better just stop at that point. Uh, as I say, I've got about 10 more slides at least, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'll stop there.
just some context for you. Um, both Rich and I are clinical psychologists. As he said, our bread and butter really is about developing the psychological understanding of problems such as psychosis and developing and testing better talking treatments for people with psychosis. So that's where we spend our time. So we work in the NHS and in universities. However, a perk of our job is that we do get to travel to nice countries. So we often meet over the last 10, 12 years in bars in various countries across the world talking about psychosis, psychology and life. So I blame you all for what's happened in my life over the last 10 to 12 years. <laughs> okay, it's great to be here in Teddy Hall. And um, there we are somewhere. There, I think. But I want to start by taking us uh, away from here, um, even away from the green fields of Oxford. Even further than this country and, uh, and India, I want to start off by taking us about 98 million miles away. Um, this is a picture from the Hubble telescope of where you've just gone. You will know where this is. It's Mars. Okay. Um, the pressure on the surface of Mars is about 0.6% of the pressure on Earth. Uh, the crust of Mars relative to the crust of Earth is three times greater. It's got a very thin atmosphere and it's losing it. If you travel about 120 million miles away from Mars, you end up here, which is Venus. Now, you can't see the surface of Venus because there's clouds of sulfuric acid swirling around it. This is the hottest planet in the solar system. Average temperature is about 460 degrees centigrade. The pressure on Venus is uh, 92 times that of the pressure on Earth. Now, as many of you are probably aware, it's been suggested that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. There were chalk and cheese that, um, that uh, women uh, have the remarkable talent of understanding people, but men have the even more important ta uh, talent of understanding maps. Um, there's even going to be a Hollywood movie of men are from Mars and women from Venus. It's extraordinarily popular. It's sold millions. I'm very jealous of at least the sales. Uh, and there's been academic arguments saying, yes, there are inherent biological differences between men and women that can be seen in behaviours. And then I think a very, very good book arguing the fact you can't detect these sorts of differences. It, there are biological differences, but you can't detect it in behaviour. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about the differences between men and women. However, I think conspicuous by its absence of any discussion of mental health in these discussions, and mental health really matters. Um, among working adults, half of all uh, ill health is mental ill health. Uh, for the individuals and the carers, uh, the pain and distress is real. Um, and let's use the smoking analogy here, but the mental illness is tied up with physical health as well, and it has effects on life expectancy. So perhaps all these books are missing the most important differences between the genders, perhaps. So, do men and women differ in their overrides of psychological disorder? Is one uh, gender suffering more in the current environment than the others? Um, the options, I suppose, the women have more, the race the same, men have more. So let's do a straw poll in the room. Who thinks women have more? Fair few have gone for that. Who thinks the race the same? Fewer people. Who think men have more? Quite a few people have gone for that. Okay, but the, the, the top one is the most common. Did a survey of Oxford uh, general public. Two thirds of the race are the same. Twenty-seven percent women have more, and nine percent men have more. So a little bit different in this room. Um, interestingly, both men and women equally rated that the race are the same. But if you uh, wrote, if you thought that women had more, then you're more likely to be a woman. If you thought that men have more, you might be a man. You thought your gender suffers. Um, so what is the answer? Um, I came to this about seven years ago writing a self-help book, an eight said guide to mental health problems, taking disorders one at a time, talking about what the problem was, how common, what to do about it, one by one, and repeatedly finding myself writing for the problem the women had greater rates than men, so uh, depression, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, eating disorders, sexual problems, sleep problems, all were much higher in women than men. Not completely a one-way street, so alcohol and drug problems are more common uh, in men than women. But it dawned on me, basically, um, that well, perhaps if women are having much more of the most common problems, then aren't they suffering more overall? 
surely that, that, that might add up to a difference. So I thought, well, that's incredibly interesting. I don't know anything about this. I'll go and find, find what the answer is in the academic journals, <laughs> which I guess people don't go to these days. They just look online. But I used to love just going down to the, the shelves in the dust and looking at the journals. Anyway, there was no answer there at all. Looked at books and things like this. Not a single mention of, 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 of differences in overall right, rates of mental health in men and women. Um, the only thing I could find actually was on the web, and that was the WHO saying that overall rates of psychiatric disorder are almost identical for men and women. So I was kind of puzzled. I thought, well, if you add it up, sure, there probably is a difference, but either people aren't talking about it or they say the rates are the same. The only people talking about a difference in mental health between the genders uh, was a feminist literature uh, mm -hmm. using titles of books that uh, obviously avoided. Um, and they were basically saying it's self-evident. So this is a quote. Madness is a female malady because it's experienced by more women than men. But how should we interpret this statistical fact? But there was no statistical fact for the world. Um, so this isn't my topic. So I had to then reluctantly in my spare time in the mornings, evenings, and weekends actually go and find out, try and find out what I thought the answer was. So this is written up in the stress sex uh, with my brother who's a writer, so he made it especially accessible to people. And very much looked at the scientific evidence, trying to answer two questions. Are there differences in overall rates between men and women? And if there are, why? This is where my life went for several years. Um, but it's intriguing, because then you obviously have to answer some fundamental questions. For example, what is mental illness? Um, this is the chemist at the periodic table, developed in the mid-19th century, a beautiful sort of ordered list by increasing protons of the basic elements of the world. Of, of, of the world. Universe, world, I don't know. Universe? Universe. Okay. Um, psychologists, cultures, what we have is this. It's called the DSM. <laughs> it's a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And uh, strangely, this wasn't uh, developed upon basic properties of uh, mental health conditions. It was developed by committee, uh, many committees. So here's an illustration of the numbers of people involved in the committees for the DSM. <laughs> That's science and psychology and psychiatry there. Um, and actually, the first DSM was developed about 100 years after the periodic table. There's now its fifth edition, which is uh, receiving a lot of, of scrutiny thanks to, thanks to people like Richard.